Hey y'all, Coach in a Fight here. And in today's video, I'm going to be talking about myself. <laughs> yeah, something I don't normally like to do, but I have been getting a lot of questions about Third Enoch and the Third Testament and some of the other books that, you know, I do classes on from my channel. And, you know, people are asking, how do I know that these books are legitimate? Um, some of them are, you know, seem to be quite desperate because, and I can understand because um, they're hearing this for the first time uh, coming from me, from coming from this channel. Some of these books, um, you hear about them only on my channel. And so people are like, you know, well, how does this guy know what he's talking about? You know, if the preacher, if, if the Pope, if none of these people are talking about this book or talking about these books, you know, how is it that Coach in the Fight believes in them and is so passionate about them and will, you know, pound on the desk saying absolutely these books are um, inspired writings? Well, so I did a class similar to this for the Third Testament of the Bible. Back when I started teaching it, I had the same kind of questions. People were um, trying to find out how it was that this book was legitimate, even though it was written in 1866. But that one was pretty easy because all of the prophecies pointed to it, like Daniel um, um, and the uh, 2300 days. Well, that's what happened after those 2300 days was we got the uh, Third Testament of the Bible. But for this Third Enoch, written in 1973, is uh, proven to be a little bit more difficult. Um, so let me, let me just tell you um, a little bit about myself, how it is that I'm able to uh, come on this channel and talk about these books. Um, knowing that they are inspired. Um, so to do that, I'm just going to give you a little bit of my testimony. I'm not going to give you all of it, just the parts related to the word of God, related to scripture. Um, I tried to do this um, uh, back when I back when my ministry first started. I actually had decided that I was going to write a book about my ministry and my journey. Um, it was actually called um, Memoirs of an Angry Soul Winner or something like that. And I got through about 23 chapters um, before I really got angry just thinking about all of the things that had happened. And it, it made me angry. Well, that was about seven years ago. And I believe that I have matured since then. But yet I'm still going to try to leave out many of the details unrelated to scripture like um some of the interactions with people over these years. Um, now I can see how they were benefiting me and helping me. But um, even, you know, them, when they hear about these things, they don't quite see themselves as being a help, if you know what I mean. So I'm just going to try to uh, talk only about the scriptural part of the journey. I will talk about some other things only when I think they're pertinent and really important. Like, for instance, the first time that I actually met or shall I say I was introduced or first contact with our father, creator, hallowed be his name. Um, talking about our heavenly father, of course. Um, so let me just go ahead and get started. Well, going back, I have to just give you a little bit of background to let you know that as a child, I was not raised in a church family at all. Um, my grandmother went to church on Easter and Christmas every so often, and she took me with her. And between the time of me being born and being about 16 or 17 years old, I only recall being in a church uh, with my grandmother maybe three or four times. Now, I did go to Sunday school 
at one period of time because they were giving us trips to the King's Dominion if you came to Sunday school. So I did go down there and draw pictures when I was really young so I can get on that trip. But it wasn't until I was about 60, I'm going to say 16 years old, that I actually first made contact with our father creator. And the way that went down and before I get into this deeply, guys, let me let me tell you, this is not going to be a fully uh, embarrassing story, but it is going to be quite embarrassing because um, what you're going to learn if you listen close is that I, there's nothing special about me at all. I've made quite a few mistakes and errors and did things um, in my life. Some of them actually benefited me. So um, anyway, this first one is kind of embarrassing because what had happened was, was I found myself at about 14 or 15 years old living by myself in an abandoned house. Um, and one of the neighbors, well, the neighbors, I lived in a community with a bunch of people that were related. Um, and I went to school with some of them and, you know, it was many, many houses and most of the houses there, the people, like I said, they were related aunts and uncles and grandmas and such. And so they kind of knew my situation. Um, I was really only going to school because of food. That was the only way I was able to get food was to go to school and to eat lunch during that time. And the neighbors, they, they figured that out. And one day as I was, um, um, there coming home from school, the neighbors, uh, stopped and, uh, chatted with me. And they told me of their grandmother who lived right, not right next door, but I could see her house from the house that I was staying in and how she lived by herself. And they, understanding my situation, thought it might be a good idea uh, for me to come and stay with this elderly lady, kind of to be there if she were to fall down Um I would be there to help her up, um, you know, if she needed help. I was basically going to be her helper. And this was, you know, perfect for the situation that I was in because obviously she was eating dinner every day. <laughs> and, you know, I might have had to wash a dish or something. And so it was benefiting both her and I. So it was a great idea. The only problem was that I stole from the lady. Um I actually stole a pair of shoes that she had there in her house and um, me being such a goofball actually wore those shoes to school with those other students. Like I said, her grandchildren um, rode the same school bus with me. And so I walked around with these shoes on in school that was actually too small. Turns out they were actually tennis shoes. I didn't know that there was a such thing called tennis shoes. I thought all sh tennis shoes or tennis shoes but these were made for tennis so it was kind of funny looking and they were too small but they were bright white and I was walking around in school and afterwards she asked me if I had uh, messed with those shoes and so I lied and told her no that I did not take those shoes well you know how that conversation ended I um, had to go back to where I came from because I had lied and stolen from this lady who was um, actually taking care of, well, she wasn't taking care of me. We were, we were um, kind of supposed to be taking care of each other, but I turned um, what would have otherwise been a um, good situation for me. For me, I, I messed it up. So I went back to um, my old abandoned house, uh, drinking water out of the creek, um, um, burning clothes for heat, you know, no electricity, such and such. And a short time later, um, um, I was approached again by this same family. But this time they were in the car and they were on their way to church. And they asked me, they said, um, would you like to go to church with us? They were having something special down at their church and they were inviting me to go. And me, you know, having been to church on, you know, those few times that I had been, um, maybe thought that there were going to be some food or something down there and decided to go. And so I jumped in the car with them and I went down 
and sat in the back row of the church and I was listening to this preacher. Um, this was a church in the hills of West Virginia, so it was a lot of people in the in the church. Um, unlike down here in Alabama where there's usually less than 10 people in a church, that one was pretty packed. And the preacher, I'm not sure if it was the pastor, or that was the first time being in that church and I've never been back since. But the gentleman that was speaking was speaking on the widow's might, the widow and her might. Um, that's the story where the woman put all that she had in the collection plate and he he was very convincing in his story. He actually convinced me um, I had 35 cent in my pocket and what I would do was I would um, collect money, um, beg money, wherever I got change from and I would make my way to the convenience store and I would buy the most calorie dense thing I could get those little Debbie cakes or whatever and I would get one of those uh, little pies and that would be my dinner so I had 35 cent in my pocket that was going to be for my dinner that night but after listening listening to this preacher speak on the widow's might I actually walked up there with my 35 cent and put it in the collection plate and you know they made a big deal about it you know they they, you know, ooh, look, you know, he's, he's, you know, made a contribution. He's made a donation. Uh, they didn't know all that was going on, but it, 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 they, they did a show appreciation. The fact that I came up there and put that 35 cent in the collection plate. Well, the next day, no doubt, the next day, you know, it was impressed on my heart to ride the school bus to my uncle's house. Now, I lived in one end of the county and my uncle lived on the opposite end of the county. And so, um, and I know where this plan came from now, but I had hatched a plan that I was going to go to my uncle's house. Um, he, he, he was a Levi. He, he's passed now, but he, a Levi, my, my daddy's older brother. And I went to his house and, uh, he happened to be there. He was a truck driver and he happened to be there at the time. Uh, praise the Father in heaven. I didn't know that I could have missed him for weeks at a time. But when I got there and I told him about my situation and I asked him, could I stay with him? And he informed me that it wasn't really his house. It was his girlfriend's house that he was living in and that I would have to ask her. So I waited, you know, till she came around and um, later that day and told her of my situation, what all was going on and told her that I needed um, that I was asking to come stay with them for a little while or whatever. And she, having heard my story, um, got very upset about it and decided to adopt me, so to speak. She took me back to that old abandoned house and she grabbed all of uh, my stuff and whatever else I wanted out of that house. And she brought me back and moved her into um, her uh, one of our children's room. Um, I can't remember. Um, anyway, so she may have actually bought this trailer after I moved there. But anyway, it was a brand new trailer that um, we were living in, but seems like I remember them bringing it in. So it may have been a situation where me moving there um, inspired her to actually replace her older model trailer with a brand new model mobile home. But anyway, the thing about it, this is important because this lady was a church lady. That was a church family. Um, her mother, her dad, um, were heavily involved in the church and this who I now call my aunt was uh, heavily involved in the church and so she actually moved me in and um, with the one rule two rules one that I would wash the dishes every day and two is that I would never miss uh, church on Sunday and I actually did miss church on Sunday and I was about 16 like I said 16 years old and I was on punishment for the whole week which was something I never really been used to like I said I was pretty much on my own up until that point um, living by myself and taking care of myself now was on punishment for not going to church so anyway um, 
fast forward a little bit and they had um, communion at church and they, it was actually a group of people that came in, some foreigners came into the church. And so, whereas normally I would have been down with the other youth playing around and goofing off, we were up in the church building with the, the grown people, mostly elder people in this church. And there were um, some visitors there. And anyway, they had communion. And so later that night, um, we were sitting around and we were talking about the events of church and they were like how did you like this and how did you like that and I was telling them I was kind of confused that the people were there seemed like they were speaking African and they laughed and explained to me no um, they were speaking in tongues these were a uh, holiness or uh, the, yeah, these were holiness people that was coming to visit and something that this church a Baptist church uh, wasn't really used to they didn't speak in tongues but this holy these visitors came and they spoke in tongues but anyway as we were sitting there laughing about it it dawned on my aunt and I can remember her facial expression as her mouth fell open and she said um have you been baptized and I told her no I really had not and she got quite upset because I had taken communion that day and so it came uh immediately that I would be I would get baptized she made some phone calls and um I can't remember if it was the next week but it was pretty soon afterwards in a cold winter morning there in the mountains of West Virginia that I was there with a couple of other people and we were getting ready to get baptized um thing about it I was the first one up to get baptized and <laughs> they literally had to break three inches of ice off of this pool, this baptismal pool, um, was outside and they had filled it up the night before and it snowed. And so there was literally three inches of ice. The, the pastor, not the, it was a, a visiting pastor that was there to perform the ceremony. They had the uh, regular pastor there to help out, but there, it was a bigger, more well-known pastor, um, that, actually did the ceremony but all three of them had on waders so they didn't feel the cold at all but I had to climb down in this ice water and they so they baptized me in ice water there um, and and this would have been about 1986 so that was the first experience um, but after that, I continued going to church at that church, but there was nothing really interesting going on except, you know, I heard a, a song by KRS-One or somebody talking about how we were the, the chosen seed. And I tried to explain it and they were like, um, yeah, we already know that. That's what the Bible say, blah, blah, blah. But they kind of blew me off. Um, so anyway, there was not much other than going to church during that time even through the time that I joined the military I joined the military right after the army I mean I joined the military right after high school I literally um, graduated from high school on like a Monday and was in the military on like Friday or something but even then I never went to church that often I did go once somebody invited me down to a um, kind of a hotel church environment where you know they had the the metal chairs in a in a conference room, and then I did go visit the chaplain one or twice. Um, maybe sat in a church service there, but I thought both of those was really weird, and so I never really um, did anything as far as church was concerned when I was in the military. And so after the military, I found myself on an Air Force base. Um, doing laundry I still I, I had a I was in the reserves and I had my military ID so I was able to go on any uh, base with my identification and so I chose to go there to the laundromat because knowing that you know the laundromat would be cheaper on base and so while I was in this laundromat there was this lady in there she was a little bit older than me but you know she was kind of pretty and you know I was that dude so I started hitting on her, started, you know, trying to make conversation with her and she realizing what I was doing, um, <laughs> informed me that not only was she married, but she was the um, base chaplain 
the chaplain's assistant or something. She worked in the chaplain's office. She was a she was a preacher type for the military is what she was. And so as she turned the tables on me to where I'm trying to win her over to my way of thinking, she actually ended up praying for me and uh, to win me over to her way of thinking. But the thing about it in the middle of our prayer, I can't remember um, exactly if she made it through the prayer at all, but I do remember a change in her talk. And, and after the prayer, she, she kind of had, she told me that she had some type of revelation or some, something she heard. And she, she, she told me that she couldn't really explain it, but she told me to go to the close. She told me to go to church. But, well, first she said, somebody's praying for you. And I said, yeah, you know, I got my aunt, you know, you know, thinking that it could be my aunt who had gotten me baptized was still yet praying for me. These many years later, I had moved out of her house, obviously gone through the military. And so that's the first thing I throw. And she was like, no, 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 no. She says something. Somebody's really somebody. Somebody's really praying for you as if. Um, my auntie's prayer wouldn't have been what she heard. She was hearing something bigger. And she said she couldn't explain it. And she told me to just go to a church. And I told her, you know, I basically got this, what church? I don't really know any churches here in this town that we're in. And she said, just go to church, any church. So I woke up the next Sunday, um, being, you know, where I was at. Um, in the city, I decided to go to the closest church to my house and it was literally only, um, two blocks away from where I was living there at the time. And I went in just like she had told me and I just went in the church and I sat in the church. Wasn't sure why I was there. I was just like she was just being obedient and I was just sitting in a church. And so this would have been about 1995. And in this church, um, they invited me to Sunday school. And so when I got to Sunday school, they put me in the class with the preacher, Pastor Allen. This would have been my first real pastor. He uh, had three of us in his class. It was like there was a bunch of um, Bible study classes going on. Um, but he, the, the head guy in the church, um took it up on himself to uh, get the brand newbies in his class. The, the people who knew nothing about nothing were sitting there in his particular class. And like I said, there were three of us. And one thing that he told us to do, I don't remember much else that he was talk, that he talked about, but he said, I need y'all to do three things. He said, I need y'all to get baptized again. And at that point, I raised my hand. I said, sir, I've already been baptized. He said, I need you to do it again. You need to get baptized again. So I put my hand back down and he said that we should read the book of Proverbs from the Bible to go to the Bible and to read the book of Proverbs. And then he said to fast for seven days. So me still yet being obedient and kind of at the will of these people. And you'll notice if I tell a lot, I give a lot of details, you'll notice that I've always kind of been willing to listen to um, these preacher types, even at my own um, um, peril. But so I did. I uh, started immediately fasting for seven days. Um, they set it up to where we would get baptized in maybe the next week or next two weeks, the next Sunday or the next Sunday after that, we would get baptized. So I did that again. And I read the book of Proverbs. So While I was there trying to read the book of Proverbs from the King James version of the Bible, I I really couldn't understand it. And so I had to get a new international uh, uh, version of the Bible and I set it down beside the King James version. So I had um, the King James version on one side and the new international version on the other side, two different books. As I read the book of Proverbs in order to get an understanding of all the disease, thou's and all of that stuff and how the book, you know, how it was written. And it worked. 
I was able to actually understand, you know, so many chapters in, I didn't need the King James, I didn't need the New International Version anymore. I could actually understand the King James Version just fine. And so I put away the New International Version as I completed the book of Proverbs. Now, the baptism so far has been one key element in this but another key part is for some reason, and I believe I know the reason now, but for some reason back then, as I was reading the book of Proverbs right there on the bed, I stopped and I said a silent prayer asking for help from my forefathers. Now, like I said, I don't know if I gathered this from the reading. It seemed like I gathered it from the reading, but I said a prayer asking for my forefathers to come in and to help me. And it was a quiet prayer. And I understand that, you know, these forefathers that I was speaking about were in the spirit world. So this was a spiritual request that I was asking for. And immediately after that, I had this visionette kind of thing. I was wide awake and all I saw was shadows who some would call shadow man right now because all it was was a shadow Figure. I just saw a black, um, blacked out figure, shadow figure of this individual that was going around and helping people. And to me, me trying to interpret my own dreams and own visions, saw that as me trying to um, or going around that I would have some mission in, in life. I knew that this was telling me some future thing that was going to happen to me to where I was going to be going around and helping people. Um. And so that was that was it, you know, wasn't much else to it. It was kind of, you know, a little five minute daydream of and then I got back to reading. But the thing about it, after I read the book of Proverbs all the way to the end, I uh, found it interesting. Now, up until that point, I had only read one book, you know, in my entire life. I wasn't a reader at all. And that book was the book of Malcolm X. Um, when the movie Malcolm X came out, I decided that before I went to see the movie that I was actually going to go read the book. So I went to the bookstore and bought the book of Malcolm X and I rushed to read it because I didn't want to miss the movie in the theater. So I rushed through the whole book um, and read it and then I went and watched the movie. So here it was. The second book that I had read was Proverbs. But the third book that I read was actually the book of Matthew, because after I finished reading Proverbs, I jumped right over to the book of Matthew. Like I said, I was really interested and I found it fascinating what I was reading there in Proverbs and I wanted to continue. So I went to the book of Matthew and I started reading there in Matthew and I read all the way from Matthew all the way to the end of the Bible, all the way through to the end of the book of Revelation. Now, I'm reading it like a novel. You know, many people say that they read the Bible, but I read it like you would read a novel from Matthew verse one and one, every word all the way through to the to the end of the book, um, not jumping around or skipping or anything. And after that, um, I kind of moved back down um, here where I'm at now. In this community, um, like I said, I have to leave out a lot of the details on how all of these, you know, transactions uh, take place. Um, I'm, I'm skipping over a lot of stuff, like, for instance, how I was involved in this group. Um, like I said, my vision, there was some confusion back in that vision. I thought that I was going to be helping people with their business because I was actually selling insurance at the time in this company with this individual, um, I don't know if I should mention his name, um, uh, mention it, I could take it out later, but Charles Scott, I was in what they call this Charles Scott organization who, who was dead set on creating what he called 100 uh, black millionaires. He wanted to, um, he had become a millionaire himself selling insurance and he thought that he had uh, it down to a science to where he could actually help anybody uh, sell uh, insurance and become a millionaire. And his methods of doing so was through all of these 
positive mental attitude books. So I had been reading all of these positive mental attitude books like um, uh, How to Win Friends and Influence People, uh, You to the Second Power, Think and Grow Rich, um, The Power of Thinking Big, um, just a bunch of um, books. It was a series of books that we had to read. But one of the uh, books was The Greatest Salesman in the World. And in this book, um, The Greatest Salesman in the World, it's, although it's a thin book, most people who read a lot can probably read it in a day. It actually takes you um, a very long time to read it. I can't remember exactly how long because you had to read like one chapter per day. And then when you got to a certain part of the book, it told you to read the book of Matthew chapter five, six and seven, three times a day for 30 days. So while I was there trying to learn how to sell, um, mag, um, insurance, I actually read that. I went through, um, the, um, I had already read the entire New Testament by then, but I read um, those what we call the Beatitudes, those three chapters, three times a day for 30 days. So anyway, back to when I moved down here um, with uh, my wife, Stacy, um, I kind of went through some other um, selling magazines door to door kind of deal these 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 have been training periods for me i've learned that you know what the father was doing leading me in the places like selling insurance was just so i can read those positive mental attitude books i may need to go read them again but the out selling magazines door to door was just so you know i can learn how to talk to people without being scared or nervous or anything and so Anyway, after that fell apart there with the whole magazine thing, I kind of had to escape out of that um, in the middle of the night kind of deal. Um, I came back to um, um, this place here, Alabama, with my wife, Stacy. Um, when I was escaping, she um, was the f closest place. I was down in Florida, and this was the closest uh, relative. My son was was here with her. And so this was my closest uh, place to 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 escape. Like I said, I was escaping. So anyway, uh, my plan was to come here and then go back to, you know, where I came from. You know, I had no no intention on staying here, but um, there was, you know, others with other other thoughts. And so what it ended up happening was I rode by the local college there. I had only been here for about a week or so and I was kind of figuring out what I was going to do and you know in life and um I thought about going to college. So I stopped by the college just to ask them when when you know just asking general questions that you would ask at a in a in a college. But the thing about it the day I got there, they was actually in signups. They was actually enrolling people. And the lady told me that she was like, you showed up just in time to enroll. Do you want an application? And I was like, oh, well, I just came in to ask questions. And she was like, well, you can take an application with you. And, you know, and so I took the application and I filled it out and turned it in and got enrolled in that college. So I ended up staying here, um, going to college there at the local community college studying um, getting an associate's degree in science. So while I'm there um, studying, I end up going to this church up the street. You guys often hear me talking about a church here. Um, this church is uh, right up the street from where I am now. And so I was going to that church, my wife and son. Um, she wasn't my wife at the time, but she and my son and I were going to the church. And um, after church, um, after Sunday school one day, I complained. I complained about how they did the Sunday school. They um, basically were, um, they had this whole book dedicated to the Sunday school class, but they was only focusing on one part of the book. And I was like, um, you know, anybody can read the verses. They was focusing on the verses. You know, I'm like, we're supposed to be doing that on our own. Anyway, um, maybe we should, you know, get into the other parts of this book that they had ordered. One of them Sunday school books that everybody have to order in order to participate. And so I thought nothing of it until the next Sunday when my wife, Stacy, um, before Sunday school started, told them that I was complaining about how they were teaching the Sunday school class. And... <laughs> 
they say, well, if he thinks he could do better, maybe he should come up here and teach the class. And so at that point, I considered myself pretty much fearless. So I jumped up and actually became the Sunday school teacher at that point. Now, it's not surprising because having read the New Testament in its entirety, I actually knew more than all of the uh, rest of the elders that were in there because at the time they had not completed it. I asked them and they had not completed it. So, but anyway, so there I was as the Sunday school teacher teaching from this, uh, this book. And, you know, I took the, could do some collections and took them on trips and different stuff, built a little play area for the kids to, to, to play with. You know, I actually got involved in this, um, this Sunday school. But then one day, you know, as I was just, you know, becoming exalted, oh, I don't know, they decided to humble me and point out the fact that I was not married and that I was living in a house in an unmarried situation. So, um, like I said, I have to leave out a lot of these details. So I ended up leaving the, the place in search of my wife. It was decided that you know, I decided that, you know, well, I had some help with it, that, you know, if I wanted a wife, I was going to have to go elsewhere to find one. So I did. And I went back to the same um, place where I was um, selling the magazine, selling the insurance and um, same church, same town that I had been baptized in. And so um, I was there in the, the town and um, still in school, um, I decided to uh, transfer from this local university, this local community college here to transfer to the university there. And so as I was coming home from school one day, I met an old friend from high school and um, I ended up going to her church. She invited me to her church. This was like a mega church, one of them big, big, big churches, you know, with you know, ten thousands of members and four thousand of them actually showing up at church every Sunday. And so I was there. It was a very fun church. Um they didn't call it church. I can't remember exactly what they called it. But you know, a lot of youth would come. They had two church services, one early morning for the um I can't remember if we were the early birds, but we may have been the early, but they had two, one for the older crowd and then one for the younger crowd. And the younger crowd, you know, they a lot of times would show up in pajamas and flip flops and, you know, just wilding out. And so it was a, a fun environment. The thing about it in this church, they would invite other preachers from around the world. Around, they had people from all over the place, big time preachers that you may have gotten to see on television at the time would come to this mega church and they would uh, do sermons and the, the the pastor there was a bishop and you know he was pretty good too um he was really good actually but w w he was so good that he would actually invite people that was better than him to come in and you know teach class teach um do the sermons well there was a few of them that came that were uh, significant. One of them, his message was um, that our father had a job for every one of us and that we really needed to try to tap into what that job was. He explained to us that um, this job would be something that we prefer to do. Um, like he said, you know, if, if you like doing hair, then you should pray to be a hairdresser for the Lord. If you like, you know, whatever it was that you enjoyed doing, you would you would pray that you would um, do this for the Lord. And so he started the prayer and we was after the prayer, he instructed that we were supposed to continue our prayer there at our on our own, um, pretty much begging that our father creator, hallowed be his name, would um, give us a job. And so there I was um, there uh, chanting 
with this beside this lady who would actually turn out to be my wife chanting that I wanted to be a soldier that I mean, she asked me she at, after it was over she's like what what were you saying and I was saying that I wanted to be a soldier for Christ I wanted to be a soldier all I really knew um was um military and you know I'm, I'm really into you know fighting so um even before the military so that's what I wanted to do was I wanted to be a soldier for for the most high so that was one individual and the next individual um, and I may have these out of order but the next one that came in talked about the crown and how we were supposed to receive a crown in heaven and he actually passed out crowns. All thousands of thousands of these people got these crowns. And we were told to place them on the outside of our garment for people to see. And when anybody asked us what was the significance of this crown, we were to witness to them and tell them about the goodness of our father. And so I did. I put the crown on my lapel, just like we had to wear our military insignia. I put it right there to the same place that I had my rank in the military. And I went to that university. And sure enough, people would stop and ask, and especially on a train, the students would see it, that bright, shiny, um, gold-looking pin there with all of the big, fake, diamonds in it and everything looking real gaudy they would ask me what is that and I would witness to them and so that's how I ended up becoming a soul winner because so many people asked that I and since I had read um, the book of Romans by then I considered the book of Romans my favorite book in the Bible and so I understood the Romans road to salvation so I came up with what I considered um, a, uh, a position of a soul winner I kind of gave myself that title that I was going to be a soul winner. I eventually lost the pen. Um, it didn't really matter anyway, but I actually went on the offensive when it came to this witnessing thing. I wasn't waiting for people to come to me. I was actually out in the street and I would actually I say it kind of slowly. I would actually hunt them. Um, I would hunt them down because what I learned quickly is that if, if you had to be in the correct situation, you know, they couldn't be busy or they couldn't be with other people or have other distractions. And so you had to pick your target. And so I was actually out there on the street looking for people that I could soul went to. And the, the what I would do is, you know, I would go up to them and ask them, you know, something like I told you, like I, I would sell magazines. I would used to sell magazines door to door. So I wasn't afraid of people at all. And I would walk up to them and I would say, hey, is your name in the book of life? And there was always three. There was three different answers. Yes. And if they say yes, I was say good. I'll see you there and then try to change the subject really quickly. If they said um, no. They didn't want it in there. Then, you know, same thing. I would change the subject really quickly. But the majority of the answer was that they didn't know what I was talking about. And so and that came in with this script that I had where I would go through the Romans road of salvation, explaining to them that if you believed in your heart and confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, you would be saved. And so I would actually, you know, at the end of that, that was the end result. They would have they would confess that, yes, I do believe. And then I would have them to state those words. Jesus is Lord. And I quote, Jesus is Lord. And then I would tell them if anybody ever asked you again, is your name in the book of life to tell them? Yes. OK, so this went on for um, a number of years. Then the next guy that came to this church, he his thing was stepping out on faith and he talked to all 4000 of these people about actually turning our backs on the world and stepping out on the promises of the Bible that our father would take care of us. And so I did that. Like I said, I, I've had a habit of listening to these people and um and so I actually stepped out on faith. Um, I left the university. I left the other jobs that I had. Um, I left the apartment that I had um, that I was um, with 
it wasn't my apartment it was the apartment um with the uh the lady like i said the one that i was going to church with uh we ended up getting married but it was it was it was her church it was her message and so we kind of stepped out on faith together and so we ended up homeless now i must say at this point um, I had not read the Old Testament at all. And primarily reason why I hadn't read the Old Testament was because um, this lady, who I said we ended up getting married, she thought she was an expert in the Old Testament. And so her, she and I considered ourselves a team. I was the expert in the New Testament because I read the whole thing. And she was the expert in the Old Testament because she had been through schooling and such. And so we were going to um, be ministers. We we had set it in our mind that we were going to be, I was going to be a Creflo Dollar type minister on television. Um, like I said, they had already promoted me to, to uh, uh, church positions so quickly uh, simply because I had read the New Testament and I was knowledgeable in what it says. It, 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 seemed to them anybody that listened that you know it was only a matter of time before I would be one of these big time ministers little did they know well anyway I found myself listening to the book the Bible on audio it, it, it's like when that lady told me back then to go to church it was like the Bible became my thing I became Bible guy right then on that day and it was pretty much, I'm going to say all, it wasn't all I was doing at the time, but it was a large part of my life. And so um, I found myself at one period of time listening to, I think it was Kenneth Copeland and Joyce Myers on the television as, you know, I was getting acquainted with the uh, New Testament and all of the Paulinian doctrines. And so I would listen to these people literally religiously. And when, you know, it was primarily those two, I remember. And then when their program would go off, I would listen to the Bible on these audio tapes that I had. But the problem with the audio tapes is that they were in this monotone speak. It was very, you know, plain talk. And it wasn't any drama to it or anything like that. And so I actually decided that I could do it better. And so I went and I purchased me my own cassette tapes, those little white cassette tapes. I bought me a case of those and a little recorder. And I actually started recording uh, me right there in the book of Genesis one and one started recording myself on these audio tapes. I would read and read and read, flip the tape over, read and read and read, put another tape in there, read and read and read until I got to the book of Exodus when I ran out of tapes. And so I figured, you know, it was a very poor reading. It was my very first time. If I was going to do this seriously, I needed to read the whole thing. So it was at that time, I shouldn't say I, but, you know, I didn't know any better then. At that time, it was decided that I would read the entire Bible, that I would finish reading, and then I would start over and I would... um I'll start recording. So I read, and this was about 1996, 1997. So I started reading. Um, I already read through Genesis and I was there in Exodus. So I put the tape recorder down and read all the way through to the book of Revelations, all the way to the end of the book of Revelation. And so then I started over again from the book of Genesis and I read without stopping all the way through to the book of Revelation. Now, at this time, I was homeless. Um, I had been in prison for the word of God. And that's all I was doing. At that point in time, I was reading the Bible 16 hours a day at least. Um, and I read it and I read it and I read it. And that was all I did. Like I said, I didn't have a job. And I was homeless and I didn't have anything else going on except for um, this Bible. And that's what I was doing 16 hours a day. I was reading seven days a week. 
And so I ended up reading the Bible all the way through the first time. And then I came back and started at Genesis and I read it all the way through every word, every jot, every tittle until you get to the book of Revelation. The way I would do it, what I learned to do was to read just one chapter at a time. If anybody came and tried to interrupt me, I wouldn't stop. I would keep reading. Even my mama, I would read to the end of the chapter. And then I would apologize, you know, for being so rude and then ask them, you know, what, how it was that I could help them. But then once I got started again, there was no stopping until I got to the end of the chapter. And the reason why I did that was because I kept restarting and losing my place. And that was the only real way that I could make it through was one chapter at a time. So I made it all the way through the second time. This is a short period. This is not a long period of time we're talking about. We're talking oh, maybe in a year or two. That here I was about to start reading the Bible the third time, starting in Genesis chapter 1 and verse 1. But this time I decided that I was going to read it aloud. And I did. I read it out loud everywhere I went. When I was by myself, I was reading aloud. When I was on the train, I was reading aloud. When I was in the homeless shelter, I was reading aloud. And just this, because this one of them is just funny. Um... One time I was reading on the train and when I got on the train, um, there was n not that many people. So I got to sit where I wanted to up at the front of the train. But then by the time we got to our destination, the train was completely packed where, you know, people were really smashed up against each other. But there I was reading. And like I said, I would read a chapter at a time. So at one point, these people got on the train during my break period. And so I was sitting there breaking. And then all of a sudden, I started reading again out loud in the front of this train. <clears throat> and so and then there, there was this lady, this little um, little lady started getting upset. You cannot read that here. You can't read that. You can't read that. Stop reading. And like I said, I would not stop for anybody. So I continued reading and she pushed her way through having to push through standing room people on this train as she pushed her way up behind me and actually grabbed hold of my bible while i was reading and so i screamed out police 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 and she jumped back like she had got caught stealing something and everybody broke out laughing and i continued reading on this train and she went back where she came from and you know that was that but then the next time <clears throat> that, you know, someone took an interest in my reading, because I'd actually try to get people to listen to me read. I'd actually um, went down to the library and scheduled a time that I would read. And only one, two people showed up um, and I read. We just sat there and read the Bible. Um, and then they, they actually got up at the microphone and read, too. So we was reading. And um, and but then. One night in the homeless shelter, as I was sitting on my cot reading, an individual came up and told me he first he was listening to me read. And then he said that he wanted to help read. And I explained to him how I was reading. Nobody ever, you know, said anything about reading before. But um, he he said that he wanted to read. So I explained that. What I was doing was reading one chapter at a time. And so I explained to him to read the whole chapter, the chapter that I was on, to read the whole chapter. And then, you know, we could talk about it before we go to the next chapter. So he started reading and he read about two verses and then he started expounding on those verses. And I cut him off. And I was like, no, 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 that's not, I can't do it like that. You know, we read the whole chapter. And, you know, when we get to the end of the chapter, then, you know, and I explained it to him, this, you know, this is how we do. And he's like, OK, OK. And he started back again. And then again, he only read one or two verses before he stopped and started preaching on these verses. And I cut him off again. And that's when he got angry with me. And he in front of everybody, the whole room, he started calling me out on how. I didn't know what I was talking about, how I thought I knew the Bible, always reading the Bible, but I didn't know anything about the Bible. And to prove it, he said that I didn't know anything about the lost books of the Bible. I didn't know anything about Enoch. I didn't know anything about the Dead Sea Scrolls. And I didn't know anything about the Apocrypha. Now, me, 
at that time argue with him saying that those books don't exist they they don't exist and he that was his proof he is like see i told you and that was all he had to say on the matter i had proven that i was unfamiliar with the scripture at that point and he went back and sat down now me still there you know waiting for some type of argument he, he knew what he was talking about and i didn't but it was pressed on my heart the very next day to go to try to inquire if these books actually existed or not so i went to the library and i asked the lady where were these books and she told me they were up in the psych part department so i went up there and found the book and i put the lost books of the bible and the forgotten books of the of eden right there in front of me and opened up to uh, verse one chapter one i don't really read um introductions and all of that stuff i found them to be too distracting so i went to the book of mary verse one in chapter one and i read all the way through the book of mary and so by this point you have to understand that i had discernment i knew what the bible was about i even though <clears throat> i had not finished the third time through you have to remember that i started off in proverbs and matthew so whereas i got cut off somewhere in uh the the uh old testament um the the third time around since i had started with the new testament the first time before the first time around it's actually three complete times of reading the whole thing um within the course of a year or two so when i read the book of mary i knew then what i was reading was inspired and it was the word of god so i checked the book out of the, the library and i went and i read it i read the whole book the lost books of the bible and the forgotten books of eden it took me eight days to read it but i read the entire book and yes after i finished reading it i started over and i read the whole thing again and then I don't know. I don't think I read it a third time because I went back to that library and found other books. And so I found the, the Apocrypha and I read all of the Apocrypha. Uh, I found the Apocrypha New Testament and I read all of the Apocrypha New Testament. And then I found the Dead Sea Scrolls and I read all of the Dead Sea Scrolls. Like I said, at this time, I was reading 16 hours a day. It's all I was doing was reading the Bible. So now. Like I said, during this time, I went through homelessness and I went through being in prison. Um, the thing about when I first went to prison for the word of God, what I did there um, was the first when I was in process and in, in the first part, you know, being in a supermax part, I was kind of, you know, by myself. Um, I did have a little Bible study there. In in this Bible study, one guy was a I think it was one guy was a murderer. He, he was there for murder. He, I knew so because he was actually repenting. He, he admitted that he had done it. Uh, another guy was a tree jumper. And I didn't know what that was, but that's the person who waits on you in the park and jumps out a tree on you. Um, and the other guy was a rapist. And they were the three members in my Bible study. Um, and I ended up baptizing two of them. But also during that time, I read the book of Revelation all day long. It only takes you an hour and a half to read the book of Revelation, but I just kept reading it. I would read it, and when I got to the end, I would start over, and then when I got to the end, I would start over, and I read it probably, um, I don't know how many times a day, five, six times a day for about 30 days that I read the entire book of Revelation. And then after I got out of that spot, I ended up going on and just reading, you know, I had my books with me. Um, and I was able to just read and I read and read and read in there while I was in prison. So when I got out of prison, I ended up back down here in this place that I leave, live now. Um, I guess it was another another escape as I escaped um, that city life that had me kind of messed up up there. Um, I really didn't have a home to go to. And I was um, in the prison system on a probation system. And so I asked them, could I relocate? And so I went through the whole process of relocating down to this country environment where I live now. And so I re-enrolled in the school that I had been in before. 
And while I was there, this time I got to take classes like um, the Old Testament and the New Testament. These were college classes. I guess it could have been like what you would get in a seminary school, but they were classes about the Old Testament. And so I got to go through those and, I, and, and the New Testament, I got to go through those. And so the thing about it, when I was there in this this um, this school, um, uh, being an adult, I was a good student. I believe if I went to college right after high school, I would have been a very poor student because, like I said, the only reason why I graduated from high school was because I needed lunch. But as an adult, I was really studious, and the teachers were giving me a lot of accolades there at the school. And I guess they were going to my head because when it came time to take history, I took both History 101 and History 102 at the same time in the same semester. And the problem with that was that the teacher was really into writing. Um, she would fill up the whole board with writing and we was expected to have all of that writing in our notes. And then we were expected to go home and do much writing, like write half the chapter out. It was more of a writing lesson than it was a history lesson. However, it was a very significant, you know, history, college level history class, too. And the thing about it, what ended up happening was when I would try to study, everything that I would study would remind me of the Bible. And so I would be on my bed. It wasn't a problem with the math and the calculus and all of that other stuff. But when it came to history, um, I could not study because I would read something in the history book and then I would go find it in the Bible and I would end up reading the Bible instead of reading my history book. Now, so there I was um, struggling to study my lesson and I said a prayer to my father and I told him that if I were going to be able to finish this college history course, if I was going to be able to finish, that he was going to have to uh, take this Bible off of me for a while because I really felt possessed at that time. like. Like I could not stop. This was the first time that I realized that I was addicted to reading the Bible when I actually like to say you don't you don't realize you're addicted to something until you try to quit. Well, when I tried to put the Bible down and study my history lesson, I literally realized that I could not do it. And so I asked for my father to take the Bible off of me. And he did. At that moment, I stopped reading the Bible. I lost the ability to read the Bible and the Bible went away for 14 years. For 14 years, it switched off to where I had been reading the Bible 16 hours a day, even while I was in college, to absolute nothing. I couldn't even read two verses if I wanted to. I couldn't read a whole chapter without you know being distracted or could, I could not read it so whereas before he was holding me there and keeping me reading when he lifted his hand it was like there was nothing and for 14 years I didn't read I, I did not read the Bible and this was in 1999 so I went through college still doing a little bit of soul winning I um, was trying to keep up with the Sabbath day and you know it didn't take me long back the first time I read through the books of Exodus and Numbers and Leviticus I knew that I was supposed to be keeping the feast days so I was keeping the feast days to the best of my ability while I was there in college getting my uh, bachelor's degree in engineering electrical engineering and going on to get a master's degree of science um, um, skipping a few parts, there was a part when I was graduating from getting my associate's degree in, in junior college that I was trying to decide if I was going to go to seminary school or not. And, you know, because I was so into the Bible, I kind of thought I was supposed to go to seminary school. But um, um, my daddy was in disagreement with it. He gave me his reasons why he thought that I shouldn't go to seminary school. But my main reason for choosing not to go to seminary school was because I didn't want to um, be, I didn't want my family dependent on my ministry for their income. Um, I knew that one day there was going to come a day based on what I had read. I knew that 
one day, there was coming a day when I was going to have to speak up and tell people something that they wasn't used to hearing. I was going to have to tell them the truth. And I didn't want to be a pastor in a congregation and have the congregation walk out on me when I tell them the truth. And then I have to go now explain to my wife and children why you are now poor and why you don't have money. Whereas you used to having things, you don't have things anymore because daddy had to tell them the truth. And I didn't want that. So I decided that my income shouldn't be based on my ministry. So I ended up going to engineering at school in the first place. So now there I was getting my engineering degree and I ended up getting a job at a uh, nuclear power plant. Um, I wasn't seeking the job. Um, I actually got into a writing class uh, for writing um, instructions. Um, you know, it was a class, an engineering class to write instructions. You know, you just built this thing and now you're going to write the instructions. Well, so the first thing as far as this writing class was she wanted us to write a resume but unlike other classes we actually had to submit the resume and I ended up getting a job after it in a nuclear power plant in a management program this is another one of those schools that I'd say father put me through was I actually had to go through a management program um, there at a nuclear power plant but anyway so there I am from 2006 is when I um, actually started at this nuclear power plant in this management program. Um, not reading the Bible, not, not even having the ability to read the Bible. Um, there in this, in this, um, in working in this job until 2013. Like I said, 14 years of not reading the Bible. And so by then, I had lost track of the Sabbath day. Wasn't even thinking about a Sabbath day. Sabbath day wasn't even on my mind no more. I was still keeping up with the uh, feast days that I knew about. But m maybe because they was only kind of once a year thing. And so, but what ended up happening was in uh, December of 2012, uh, when they had the whole Mayans calendar uh, thing where the Mayans were supposedly saying that the world was going to end. Um, I was hearing it so much where they was putting it on the television. Even the news was talking about how the, uh, the world was about to end. And so I remember some studies that I did uh, back when I was in college where I went through and pulled out all of the dates from the Bible and put them in a spreadsheet. Um, kind of like you see me doing now where I go in and pull out dates in the Bible and talk about them. Well, I got that when I was in college and I pulled out every um, every place in the Bible where it mentioned a date, month, month and date, month, year, whatever. And I created a spreadsheet of every single date in the Bible. And so I remembered that study. And so I, I went and I looked up what day was December the 12th 2022 and I went back and found all of the scripture that talked about that particular date of course you had to you know um, um, take it back to the to the sacred calendar but the end result that I concluded was not that the world was about to end but that the world was about to change and that we was about to get closer to God was my statement that I pasted on Facebook um, that the world wasn't about to end, that it was about to change. This was, you know, based on the date alone, um, that it was about to change. And that as a, a result of this change was that we was about to get closer to God. Well, I actually got closer to God in that moment because I actually started reading the Bible again. Um, at the time, it was a 66-mile uh, trip to work, 66 miles both ways. And so what I ended up doing was getting... Uh, the the Bible on my I got it in my car somehow I don't know if I Bluetoothed it in or whatever but I was listening to the Bible on my way to work and once again it was the book of Revelation as I was listening going back and forth to work they're starting in about 2012 now 2013 um, I did a a really big charitable deed I believe I saved a guy's life during a a snowstorm he was walking in in a snowstorm and I ended up um, taking him into my house and feeding him and I believe that act actually did some good as far as the wrongs that I had done stepping away from the Sabbath day we had you know started doing pagan holidays and and you know 
um, different stuff over, you know, on those 14 years when I had um, been removed from the Bible. And so there in about 2013, I ended up doing this charitable deed. But then shortly after that, I started uh, praying, asking Father, well, Heavenly Father, what what's the plan for me? Um, I'm reading the book of Revelation. It's talking about this mark of the beast and how you're not going to be able to buy or sell if you don't have the mark of the beast. And now I'm looking at my co-workers here and I'm like, you know, they 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 get their same food. They buy and sell the same way I do. You know, they. So what's different? What's different between them and me? How am I different? And how, you know, how am I going to be able to buy and sell if they're not? So it didn't make sense that, you know, and so I started praying and turns out he already had my solution in hand in the form of a severance package. The company was going through a reduction in force where, you know, they got really so many thousands of people and I got caught up in that. And I decided once again to come back to this area where I live in now. And once again, I ended up back teaching that church up there. Um, the the uh, well, first of all, what happened was we we got here with the intention on becoming cattle ranchers. But then when the Feast of Tabernacles came around, my son, um, when he heard me talking about how even though we had been keeping many of the feast had never participated in tabernacles decided that he wanted to sleep in a tent and so we went and we purchased a tent and him and I got in the tent for the feast of tabernacles the first time and then the second night uh, we was there but then the third night and, and so on other family members started coming out to the point where we needed a bigger tent and then um, the last night um, our whole family was out there in a tent and so this was the Feast of Tabernacles, and that's significant if you understand, you know, how these feast days correspond to um, our father's walk. So after that, after my son convinced me to do the Feast of Tabernacles, that's um, um, there was some disturbances in the house related to pagan holidays. And like I said, I don't want to get into the to the people part of this. So I'll jump all the way to. Uh, February, January or February of the year 2015. The Tabernacles was in 2014. But in 2015, as I was, you know, trying to get a grasp on what all was going on with me, some, some things were going on with me, and um, the Father put it on my heart to get baptized again. And so I came home and I told my wife that we we should get baptized again and so we did um, I baptized her in the pool in the bathtub not in the pool in the bathtub and then she turned around and baptized me and then we baptized the kids there in the bathtub well then shortly after this it was pressed up on my heart to um, the feast of Passover and to actually keep the communion feast during the feast of Passover now that was something I've never heard of actually drinking uh, uh, the wine and eating the bread on Passover I had done communion before but it was you know during random times of the year and it wasn't specifically for Passover but so I was teaching in the church teaching Sunday school and when I went to teach Sunday school the lesson was even though Passover was coming up in the next month the lesson was on tabernacles and I thought it was a good opportunity to talk about tabernacles and so I and to talk about Passover that was coming up so I taught the class on tabernacles and then ended up uh, t as, as a closing I talked to them about Passover and so that was my last day of teaching in that church so <clears throat> So I ended up keeping Passover, me and my wife and kids ended up doing Passover by ourselves in our own home. So after that, um, I was made aware of the Book of the Covenant. Now, let me tell you how this happened. I, <clears throat> I had started uh, my ministry again on Facebook. I was doing ministry work on Facebook through Facebook posts, just posting up little 
uh, Bible verses and chapters and this, that, and the other little, you know, short talks and stuff. And I was trying to break into, I guess I was, you know, being uh, trained for what I'm doing now. But I tried to break into blog talk radio. I was going to get on the radio and do ministry work from the radio on the internet radio system. So I got in there and um, I, you know, got me a little account and did some little trial things. But in the process of, of, of getting in it, getting into it, I decided to uh, listen to some other channels, even get involved with some other channels, um, some other stations. And there was one station out of California that was talking about natural law. And in that class, they would um, basically, it would always end up talking about Christianity and bashing the Christians. And at the time, I would call in because when they would they do this, I would call in. And so I almost became like a personality on their show because I would call in every day and we would sit there and I would bring up verses about, you know, um, what they were talking about you know sometimes they was right sometimes they was wrong and i would argue with them but whether they was right or they was wrong i would provide the verses and you know of what the, of what the subject was on and so in the middle of one of these so-called arguments you know we, it was very polite and all of that nobody it, it was i shouldn't call it an argument it's more like it's just a, um, a debate um it came up about they brought up the subject of the book of eli and I got confused because I thought the book of Eli was a real book in the Bible. And so I started searching my Bible for the book of Eli, looking all the way through, searching everything. You know, is it a hidden book? Is it an apocryphal book? Is it in the Dead Sea Scrolls? Where is this book of Eli? And I could not find this book. And while I was finding it, I found all other stuff. I found the sons of Eli. They wasn't very good um, guys. And I found the book of uh Gad the seer and I found the book of Jasher and I found all kinds of other books mentioned in the Bible but not the book of Eli and so I kept looking and kept looking of course it turns out it was a movie but anyway one thing I did find was the book of the covenant and so while I was looking at this the book of the covenant I was like what's the book of the covenant I ain't heard of that I had heard of Jad I had heard of Gad and I had heard of Jasher and I had heard of you know Nathan and all of these other books but the Book of the Covenant didn't didn't really ring a bell, so I started pursuing it. What is this Book of the Covenant? And I found a PDF of some work that a college student had done explaining the Book of the Covenant and how it was actually four chapters, Exodus chapter 20 through 24 uh, verse 7 was the Book of the Covenant, and I never knew that. And so that's how I became aware of the Book of the Covenant, and I actually started doing classes letting people know what the book of the covenant was so now during this time we was still in a transition time and um, I was actually in a process of buying this property and so we ended up on this property here and um, by then like I said I wasn't teaching in that other church up there anymore just local church up the street but I was trying to get into other churches around so I would go to other churches around and I would um, um, do work in their, in, in their churches just you know being there maybe in Bible study just speaking up I was trying desperately to get into teaching the Bible and while I was at the library one of um, the old librarians from the junior college, from the community, co community college, recognized me there. And she, me and her was talking, and turns out her husband had built a church. And when she found out that, you know, I was in, that I was uh, knowledgeable of the scripture, she invited me to her church to help out in her church. And so I went down there and actually started ministering to them on their Wednesday night um, Bible study might have been Thursday but I would go in every um, week and actually teach them uh, the, the Bible the Old Testament the the whole congregation there um, we actually went through uh, the uh, books of Exodus I think we made it through the whole book of Exodus and so I ended up teaching them the covenant but then um, when they're regular teacher came back 
uh, they decided that they were going to go the pagan holiday route instead of tabernacles. So I ended up uh, leaving that congregation uh, too. And this was in 2017, right before the Revelation 12 sign in the sky came out. Now, I didn't really know about the Revelation 12 sign in the sky. I never had studied it. I didn't know anything about it. I had started hearing people on YouTube talk about this so-called Revelation 12 sign in the sky. And so as the date approached, listen to these guys more and more, I started really thinking that, you know, something big was going to happen during this, this, this Revelation 12 sign in the sky. So I actually started posting classes on YouTube uh, related to it. I had put up a few classes before, but it wasn't that many. Um, like I said, I was trying to get into churches and stuff. So I was posting classes, um, um, just what does the Bible say? What does scripture say about this Revelation 12 sign in the sky? And so, of course, the Revelation 12 sign in the sky came and it went. Now, by then, by, by now, and I'm skipping maybe too many parts, by now, um, this was 2017, but back in 2015, I had actually started work on the calendar. Um, I wanted to figure out the sacred calendar to get back on track, of course, that was necessary. So I went and read the book of Enoch in order to um, um, read it. I had read it before, but the thing about it, when I was reading the, the Bible, I, one of the reasons why I had to read it so much, so many times, was because I was reading it fast and I wasn't stopping and meditating on it. So this time, I went back and read the book of Enoch, first Enoch again, but I had to uh, stop and pay attention because I wanted to learn how the sacred calendar worked. So there was a lot of, um, there was some classes on YouTube related to uh, the calendar. Um, but then now here in 2017, I start doing classes related to uh, prophecy. Now, of course, you know the the prophet the, the the prophecies didn't turn out the way the guys said they were. You know, they was talking about the rapture this and the rapture that, and of course nobody was supernaturally removed from the planet. So it was a bit of embarrassment as you know I had to deal with people who held me responsible for what the other channels were saying and telling me that I didn't know what I was talking about this and didn't know what I was talking about that and so anytime I would and and you know there was so much going on that um, um, it, it was just an embarrassing time for me if I had just learned to keep my mouth shut um, then you know but it, I was talking and everything I was saying was backfiring in my face and it got to the point one night I found myself crying on the bathroom floor and and I was asking father to you know why why is all of this bad stuff happening to me like I said I have to leave out that kind of stuff but I was praying why why is all of this bad stuff happening to me and I ended up you know just saying thank you for some reason I broke out in the just thank you thank you thank you thank you thank you with tears in my eyes just thank you thank you thank you for the pain thank you for the for all of this is going on you know right? weird that you know but anyway so the next morning I woke up with a certain portion of the Bible on my heart I'm not gonna tell you what that portion of the what it, what it was about so I went to the internet went to YouTube and I put in that term that search term and I put it I typed it in and I pushed enter and a whole new world opened up for me as I started hearing video and video about this certain people written about in the Bible. And so I listened to this, um, these people talk and describe this group. If you if you do this, you probably one of these people and all of this kind of stuff. And I sat there and listened to these for about a week or two thinking, you know, these, these people, I, I, I can relate to what they're talking about. But anyway, I'm saying too much. One of the things as I was studying, I noticed that they were talking these verses that I felt like I had heard before, but I don't, re I couldn't remember what book it was. So once again, I started going through my library. I've, I've been collecting paper, so I'm going through my books, and of course that didn't go, so I go digitally, and I get on the internet, and I'm trying to find um, the books that contain these verses. So what I ended up doing was pausing the video 
and I typed out they had the words up on the screen of these verses and so I typed out the words word for word in the Google and and uh, in quotes and then that's how I found the third testament of the Bible so this was around March of the year 2018 that I was now seeing this book called the third testament of the Bible so what I did was I went back after seeing that there was a such thing called the third testament of the Bible I went back to YouTube and found an audiobook on it and knowing how to download YouTube videos I downloaded all of the third testament of the Bible all 66 chapters converted them over to mp3 and put them on my on my mp3 player and I walked around listening to these just as I was doing work and such getting ready for the feast of unleavened bread that was coming up and I decided that or it was decided that I was actually going to listen to the entire book over the feast of of tabernacles because I was working and you know you hear bits and pieces but I was being convinced that what I was hearing was the Word of God so I went in during the feast of unleavened bread when you're supposed to read the Bible for a week that's all I did was listen to the third testament of the Bible over and over in my in my sleep at night during the day I just had these headphones on walking around in my own world listening to this book being convinced that this was the word of God I absolutely knew that this was the word of God speaking to me this was the third testament of the Bible so then I got on YouTube to see if anybody had done so and decided to put up the very first class ever put up on the third testament I like being the first to do stuff that's why I read the book of Elijah the apocalypse of Elijah because there was nobody else that, who had done it who had read the apocalypse of Elijah so I went in and posted my uh, reading of the apocalypse of Elijah um, but somebody had already done an audio book of the third testament so what I decided to do was to actually start doing classes on the third testament and so I started doing classes on the third testament in uh, 2018 and I did a few classes of the third testament I was actually going chapter by chapter I think I made it up to uh, chapter 9 before I made a, a mistake um, basically um, said something that I shouldn't have said and um, the classes kind of stopped there but anyway now, I didn't say it to somebody I said I said it in prayer I said something to the father in prayer um, basically I got to the part where it was talking about uh, Joseph and and the old time stories and I'm like oh, why is this part in here we already know this part and it kind of yeah it it was bad I ended up having to do some charitable deeds even to be able to hear it again so but anyway what ended up happening was I understood the part where it said we had to learn how to live the third testament not just speak on it so I decided to put the third testament down and I actually started reading and reading it with the intent of not teaching but learning and I um, started living it out trying to live what it was and I said okay the next time I come and teach I'm going to be on the other side of this thing I'm going to be third testament qualified so to speak not just teaching some book just cause it's some book but I'm actually gonna learn how to live within this thing so I came back teaching in, in 2019 after I had some dreams I had dreams that let me know that uh, my ministry was going to be needed and so I actually got back into it and started teaching from the third testament in 2019 so that's my experience with the Bible you know and um, why I feel like I know when I hear scripture you know like people say man is incapable of writing scripture and even if he could write it he would not because it casts him in a bad light so um, I do know when I'm reading scripture and when I'm not so let's fast forward to 2022 when one of you guys came to visit um, he just wanted to come visit you know we went through the whole thing you gotta pray about it first and he ended up coming he actually made it and right before he left it was uh, he didn't get all that he thought he was gonna get done here and I didn't get all he didn't get all that I thought he was gonna get done here you know either but I believe his purpose of being here was 
right before he left he asked me about the keys of Enoch now I actually had the keys of Enoch on the shelf I had bought them back in 2015 when I heard about the keys of Enoch when I first heard that there was a such thing called third Enoch I went and I ordered it I must have ordered it from um, the Academy of Science directly because I, I didn't pay a lot of money for it I seemed like a minimum were paying fifty dollars for it and that's what they charge for it while everybody else charges a hundred and hundreds of dollars for some reason but anyway when the book arrived I couldn't read it I tried reading it and out of all of the readings that I had done I could not read this book third Enoch the keys of Enoch it was too hard of a read it was too far out there and I didn't understand it I, I even doubted it, it whether it was legitimate at one point because of the language and stuff that it was using and what it was talking about and all of this I mean I knew who Metatron was but here is this 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 is this is something significant so the book sat on the shelf and and then that start like I said 2015 and over the years I tried to read it but I could never get past the first chapter I even tried to get other people like my son to read it maybe you can read it and nobody could read this book it just sat on the shelf until this guy his uh, name is or his channel is um, voice in the wilderness or something like that he he was there one evening at the dinner table and he asked me if I knew about third Enoch or the keys of Enoch and I said yeah I got that book on the shelf so I went back to my library and pulled it out and showed it to him and he was like wow he actually got the book so he he opened it up and started flipping through it and started reading verses like he was just flipping I was doing something else I can't remember what I was doing but I wasn't paying much attention to what he was doing as he was sitting there flipping through th this book called the keys of Enoch and every once in a while he would pull he would start quoting a verse and he would read a verse and and you know something that would catch his eye and he'd flip some more and then he'd read another verse and then he'd flip some more and then he'd read another verse and I was like wow and I was like oh I got another one like that here some one of them that you guys had sent a smaller book um, on the keys of Enoch or similar to it and I brought it out and so he had one book and I had the other one and we were flipping through and I would pull out a verse and I would say, wow, look what it says here. And we would read it and then, you know, um, and then he would read something. And one of the things that came out of the book um, in that little, I don't know what you would call it, but one of the things that he read in there, one of the things that caught his attention was how the Kabbalah was actually scriptural text. And that's something I didn't believe in at the time. I doubted it, maybe even publicly doubting this book. I had never read it and I probably shouldn't have been running my mouth but you know everybody got all of this bad stuff to say about the Kabbalah and so I was um, thinking on it but anyway he read this and he was when he was read this verse and how it the Kabbalah contained this so-called esoteric knowledge but but it said that those who um, tried to understand or try to embrace that the Kabbalah without the Old Testament without the the, cov the book of the covenant and the laws would actually harm themselves and would actually take them themselves basically what you think about when you think about Kabbalah you would turn yourself into a Kabbalist if you didn't have the Old Testament um, understandings you know and so I was like wow that's that's really interesting and so I'm I'm sitting here and I remember now he has the other book I have the keys of Enoch and I still quite can't quite read it, mainly because I hadn't read the introduction. I don't read the introductions of a book until after I read the book. So I didn't know how the book works. I didn't know which was the, the, the key and which was that. I didn't know anything. And so I'm sitting there. And so I decided to draw lots. And I asked him, you know, I showed him how the lots would work. And I got him to help me. So him and I drew lots on whether I would read this book. And so the first thing that came out, you know, should I read this book? And a lot came out, yes. Now, I was surprised at this point because, you know, like I said, I, I wasn't verbally, not out loud, questioning the, legit, questioning the legitimacy of this book. But I was thinking it. And I didn't understand it. So I drew lots again. Should I just read the key? All the way through, should I just read the key? The answer was no. Should I just read the description of the key? The answer was no. 
So I go, hold up. So, so I'm conti- we're continuing to draw lots. Should I read the entire book? And it came out, yes. You know, and then, and I, I guess I was in doubt and maybe even didn't want to read it because I kept asking questions. Should I read the whole book, cover to cover? The answer was yes. It kept, the lots kept coming out. Read the book, read the book, read the book. And I decided that I was going to read the book. But it turned out to be a very, very hard read. But I was determined. I had the lots, you know, I follow what the lots say do. And, you know, lots told me to, uh, the, the father, because the, the, way I, the way I do it is I pray for his will first. And then I pray for him to show me his will through the lots. And I say that prayer in your son's name. And, you know, before I do it, just like we're supposed to. And so this thing is consistently showing me that I'm supposed to read this book. So I start reading it in January. And it's a tough read. And so what I decided to do is that I'm going to read it twice. That I'm going to read it, push through it. Just pushing through it, you know, not slowing down and letting it, letting it you know, slow me down because of the hard terms and the hard understandings and the hard lessons in there. But to push through it and then I'll come back around until the end. Um, and, and after I finish it, come back around and start over again. The thing about it, by the time I got to the end of this book, guys, not only is this the inspired writing, but this is actually Third Enoch. This is the... the, the knowledge that we're supposed to get guys i am 100 percent convinced that this is legitimate that it's real that it's true that there may be some translation errors in there we used to translation errors but this is the this book here is is this it um anybody who wants to know how all of this works third third enoch um it's, it's, it's a tough book because it's written on a scientific level. But like I said, the father put me through engineering school and I have a master's of science degree. So I understand most of these terms in here. And this book jives with everything that I learned in engineering school, everything that I learned in master of science school, everything or graduate school, I should say, everything that I learned from reading all of those scriptural documents, everything in there lined up except for like I said um, translation errors and there are not many of, of them at least in this sixth edition that I have so when somebody say well how do you know that the keys of Enoch is, is legitimate uh, guys all I can offer you is that I read it and it that it's consistent the thing about the father's word is it's consistent and no matter what book it is, it's consistent. It all says the same thing. I can show you up on my library right now, praise our Father in Heaven, a thousand different scriptural documents, and they are all consistent. The lost books of the Bible, the Dead Sea Scrolls, forgotten books of Eden, the Apocryphal Old Testament, the Pseudepigrapha, the Apocryphal New Testament, uh, Keys of Enoch. They are all, they all got the same message. They all say the same thing. They, 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 may not, they may not cover the same subjects, but when they touch on the, the, the subject, they are all consistent. And they all are all real. Like, like I said, man can't write this on his own. He has to be inspired to do so. The thing about this, this, this third Enoch, it tells us how and where this information is coming from. I learned in that book that back when I said that prayer, even though I, uh, I was unaware of what I was doing when I asked for my forefathers to come and help me, I was actually calling up on uh, those Ophanim individuals to come and, uh, and help me. And so, I, I don't know what else to say. You know, this, 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 this book is a hard read. It's, I'm not going to say it's not for everybody. Everybody can get something out of it. But if you are a scientist, if you um, if you are a Bible scholar, if you like understanding the why of things, you know, in the, in the old in the Bible, in the Old Testament, New Testament, we were just told to do it. We was never told why we were doing it. But in this book, we're tell we're told why we're doing it, how all of this works, and it explains it on a scientific, mathematical level. This book is this book is it, guys. This is this is part of. The Enoch series. This is third Enoch. This is part of the Enoch series. 
and we find out who Enoch is and why he's he's doing this for us helping us through this time so um, I wish I had more to tell you on how you know that this book is legitimate other than uh, mm -hmm, uh, take my word for it guys but you know take take my word for it I, I'm, I'm the scripture guy you know I, I'm I've been Bible boy for a long time I take this very seriously um, and you know this this book jives this book if you if you've been around my channel especially down in the comment section you know I don't I don't let nothing get past me I don't I don't I don't I don't, I don't go for no nonsense no non truths I can't resist calling it out and speaking up on it you know and you know I don't go for the okie doke and there's no way you're gonna put a whole big book of okie doke in front of me and you know it slipped past me that it that just ain't gonna happen praise our father in heaven uh, him allowing me to have discernment that that ain't gonna happen and this book here just like the third testament is 100% truth great book of life 100% truth the book called the shepherd of hermits 100% truth these books are here for our salvation they, they are trying to suppress them from us so that they can keep us ignorant that's that's the main tool of the Illuminati and the New World Order is to keep us ignorant of scriptural truths so that when these things come up on the world we'll think that our only hope is to go down there and let them feed us in his in their concentration camps and so that they can only do that if we don't know what the prophecies are how things are supposed to work out why these things are coming up on this world you want to know what this pole shift is about it's covered in third Enoch you want to know why the Sun is getting so hot it was covered in third Enoch you want to know why people are getting so mean why families are breaking up right now it's covered in third Enoch you want to know where we came from it's coming in third Enoch you want to know where we're going it's covered in third Enoch you want to know how we're gonna get there it's covered in third Enoch this is the, this is the book for this is the book for the elite guys I, I you know the scriptures separating us to be to 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 be forthcoming you got those who are only going to love the Torah. That's all they're going to care about is the Torah. Just like you're going to got uh, all the Old Testament. And just like you got people that's only going to like the, the New Testament. And they ain't going to ain't gonna care nothing about the, 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 the Old Testament. Well, then when the Third Testament comes out, those two groups right there, they're going to get left behind. Because they ain't ready to, to embrace the Third Testament. So there's a separation there as those people who, you know... You know, but got nothing good to say about the Third Testament gets excluded from that knowledge. Well, the same way with this Third Enoch. If if you have a problem with extra canonical books, you're gonna have a problem with Third Enoch. It's just 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 that just just that if you believe in suppressing the Scripture, them same people that believe in suppressing the Scripture, they ain't gonna want nothing to do with Third Enoch whatsoever. So, um. Like I said, I wish I had more to show you other than proof what's going to end up happening as, as this stuff materializes and comes to light. Uh, we'll start seeing it in past tense and then you'll say, well, yeah, um, there is absolute proof, you know, that that this book is legitimate because it, just like the Bible, tells the future. That's how you know um, a book is, is, is inspired and written by, you know, our Heavenly Father. Uh, inspired by Heavenly Father because they tell the future and you can see those uh, futuristic events take place you can see that in 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 the Bible you can see that in uh, the, the Third Testament and you can see that in in the keys of Enoch too I'll bet I'll bet everything I own on it I'll bet everything including my life on it that um, this is inspired writing um, and I take it from me that's all I can say yeah, take it from me um, I don't know what else to say, so I'm just going to end it there. If you have anything you can add, I'll see you in the comment section.